My name is uh, Lucas Frizek. Um, I'm uh, a new hire at Egalia. I started at the beginning of this year. Um, I'm not new to graphics development, but I am new to the open source community and contributing. And so when I started, my uh, colleagues had recommended that uh, getting Freedrino to run on uh, Android would probably be an interesting project to start with, uh, to get familiar with Mesa and to start contributing stuff uh, upstream. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to cover uh, a few things, uh, all of them related to Freedrino, all of them related to Android. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, state of the drivers with the Adreno GPUs um, and why this is important when you're trying to run something on Android. A little bit about why you might want to do this, how you actually build Mesa to run on Android, um, driver changes that are necessary to run on Android, and then some areas of um, needed improvement for Android support in Mesa. Um, but to start off, you know, uh, and anything like this, it's important to show your work. So when I started my development, a lot of it looked like this, uh, where you have broken rendering. That line in the middle of the screen is not my problem. That's uh, a broken device, so I do apologize for that. It's not a problem I cause. Uh, but all the broken rendering behind that, that is a problem that I did cause with uh, you know, synchronization, things not working, uh, the stuff being displayed before the GPU is actually finished rendering it. But in the end, it looked like this, where you know, stuff actually looks like what you want it to look like. The capabilities actually report the driver as being Freedrino and many applications running without any fault at all. So to start with the state of drivers uh, for Adreno and um, Qualcomm GPUs, there is a tale of two drivers here. Um, there are two kernel mode drivers that give you access to Adreno GPUs. Uh, one of them is a little bit nicer. It's the MSM driver. It's your friendly neighborhood upstream driver that uh, is a lot easier to target, plays really nicely uh, with Mesa. And then there is the less friendly uh, KGSL driver, which is the uh, driver that uh, Qualcomm supports on Android. Um, and it's what their proprietary user space supports. And so the work that I ended up doing was trying to get Freedrino actually to work with KGSL because that's what you end up using when you run um, Android on a Qualcomm device. Now, there are some other things that uh, are nice about using uh, KGSL. Uh, one of them is that not support for every SOC for Qualcomm is not upstreamed. So if you do have a use case where you're using Android, uh, it can be a lot of work to try to merge um, upstream code into a downstream branch. And another interesting benefit I learned about uh, as I was working on the project was that uh, it provides the ability to run both Qualcomm's proprietary driver and Freedrino on the same hardware, um, you know, in like a CH root or just, you know, switching which drivers, driver is being loaded at runtime. And uh, this was a pretty interesting thing, and I got a lot of, I guess, attention on my work, because uh, apparently uh, Panfrost already supports this, and people like to uh, run CH roots on their Android devices uh, to use a hard, um, hardware installation in a Linux desktop environment on Android. So, um, some notes about the work I did. Uh, it wasn't entirely from scratch. Uh, Turnip already has very good support for the KGSL kernel mode driver. So a lot of the work that I did was actually based on the Turnip developers. So any Turnip developers watching this talk, thank you very much. Uh, you made my life a lot easier. And another nice thing about Freedrino is that the interface to access the kernel mode driver has already been pretty heavily abstracted. There is an interface in the source Freedrino DRM folder that uh, you know, provides a convenient API to accessing a kernel mode driver. In what is upstream right now, it currently splits support for MSM and virtual I the virtual I.O. driver. Uh, and it's what I use to get all my work started uh, for a different kernel driver backend. Now, all the work I did was on a Pixel 4a device. Uh, this was convenient because uh, it has an uh, Adreno 618 GPU, 
which is already supported by Freegino. So I didn't have to worry about you know, driver bugs at the same time I was trying to get uh, this device working. I was using both uh, two versions of the Android NDK, uh, version 25 and 13. And later in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about why there's two different NDK versions that ended up being used. And the other convenient thing about using a Pixel device is uh, Google has this handy tool for uh, Android where they have a bunch of ROMs available and a tool to flash them to your device. And um, this is very important because when you're messing with the uh, system partition on an Android device, you need a user debug ROM that actually lets you unlock the file system because Android can be very uh, locked down. So in my case, since I'm using a Pixel device, I can just go use this nice tool from Google, go find a user debug ROM for ASOP, download it on my device, and not worry about building a ROM myself. If you're trying to support this on a non-Google device, I think there would be a lot more work uh, trying to get the user debug ROM set up, which would include uh, building Android yourself. Now, um, that's getting started. What about building uh, Mesa on Android? Well, it's actually a lot easier than you think. It's probably the easiest part of this project altogether. Uh, if you're targeting the Android NDK, um, it gives you a normal tool chain that you can just target with uh, Mason cross files. And in fact, the Turnip developers have nicely written a Android guide for building Turnip on Android uh, that you can conveniently use to, do the, to build the same work that I did for building Freedrino. And like cross-compiling to any other target, there's some Mason configurations that you have to set for you know, what platform you want. Um, there's Android-specific ones for what SDK uh, version you're targeting. So in my case, all the work I did is targeting SDK version 15 or 25, sorry. So I had to put you know that in there. Um, there's Android stubs that you have to build just to um, deal with libraries that you don't necessarily have access to at build time. And of course, you know what drivers you want to target. In my case, you know Freedrino, and Freedrino also has this additional argument for uh, kernel backends you want to build. So you uh, for the work here, I want to target the KGSL kernel mode driver. Now that's great. We built something, but you know this isn't you know friendly Linux land. Uh, how do you actually deploy what you did on the device? You can't just you know set up an install folder, LD preload your install folder, and set whatever environment variables uh, Mesa wants for loading the right driver. It's not that simple. You have to do a little bit more work and figure out what the heck Android is doing under the scenes. Um, the Turnip developers have kindly wrote uh, in that tutorial how to actually do things for Vulkan. And for doing things for OpenGL is very similar on um, Android. And uh, for Vulkan, there's files in the vendor, vendor lib64, so a system partition, uh, for where the driver files are. Um, in order to access those files so that you can write to them, uh, you need to unlock the system partition, which is not that hard as long as you have the user debug ROM. You can just run some ADB commands, and then you're, you have read-write access to the system partition. And uh, to actually find out what libraries Android is loading, thankfully Android is in fact open source, uh, and we can see what's going on there. And you can just go into the EGL loader source code within Android and actually look at the, what libraries it loads and find out that it um, loads libraries from the vendor lib64 EGL folder. And uh, it loads uh, these libraries based on a vendor name. So you have to add a vendor name to what Mesa builds so that it can actually load the driver that you're trying to work with. So in my case, it's the Adreno one, so I had to add the EGL Adreno and the Glass 1 Adreno, and those are both used for the EGL implementation and OpenGL ES1 implementation, respectively. Uh, the Glass uh, V2 uh, does not have the vendor name appended to it, and it provides the implementation for Glass 2 and, and beyond. Now, you, uh, if you go and you replace that library, those libraries, and you go and you try to run something, uh, you'll quickly find that uh, it's still using the old driver. You know, you, you run the um, GL info app uh, on Android, you'll see that uh, Qualcomm's driver is still loaded, and you start scratching your head and going like, "Okay, what's going on here?" 
And then uh, this is another case where I'm happy that Android is open source and there is some documentation on this thing. And uh, you'll find out that Android uh, preloads the OpenGL driver that it uses at uh, initialization, which is, I guess, good for performance uh, on the system, for doing things like the system UI rendering and for applications. But it's not nice when you are trying to uh, iterate on development and you don't want to have to restart your device every single time you make a driver change. So thankfully, there's a way to disable this uh, preloading feature. Uh, and it's actually documented publicly within Android's documentation. Uh, there's this uh, disable GL preload property in Android that you can uh, override and set to uh, true so that um, anytime uh, an application starts up on Android that's going to use uh, OpenGL, it will reload the driver or the library. Now, the other thing about uh, this setup with the kernel mode drivers is that uh, Freedrino also expects some environment variables to be set. And on Android, uh, you don't really have environment variables. Um, they have their own system called properties. And thankfully, uh, Mesa developers who have already thought this through and have um, added an abstraction to the environment variable system so that if you're running on Android, it will uh, conveniently use props like environment variables with the uh, added note that any underscore in a property name gets replaced with the period. And if the prop doesn't have Mesa in front of it, it will add Mesa in front of it uh, so that they're all in the Mesa namespace. But doing that, we can now set all the environment variables we need to allow the uh, device to or the driver to load properly and uh, start running. Now let's talk about testing. So um, with everything that I just talked about right now, if you want to go and open an Android app, like an APK, um, it will go and it will load the driver and use it. Uh, you know, you can open things like the uh, GL Info app, and then, you know, it's going to report all the capabilities that Freedrino reports. It's going to report the name that Freedrino reports. Um, and that's great and all, but those aren't usually what graphics driver developers use for testing most of the time. Uh, a big part of our life is uh, CTS, and thankfully, uh, CTS can be built as an APK so that you can run it on Android and actually see that uh, your OpenGL implementation is conformant. But in my case, what I was doing is comparing uh, my CTS results on Android against CTS results on Linux to make sure I haven't broken anything in the process. But this is not the most uh, convenient developer environment. Um, CTS is not quick when you're running through the entire test suite. Um, I know uh, probably a lot of you like to run things in parallel with DEQP runner. Uh, so uh, I think you can imagine anytime you want to run CTS, having to sit through the whole thing is a not, not desirable. So something that I did learn is that you can actually run uh, command line applications on Android. Um, the developers who worked on Freedrino reverse engineering very early on in the process set up this nice reverse engineering tools repo uh, where they set up some application infrastructure that allows you to build OpenGL applications that you can launch from an ADB shell. And if you're not familiar with an ADB shell, that's basically just like bash on your um, Android phone, you like connect it to your computer, you type in ADB shell, and then it gives you a shell that you can start running commands on um, your Android device. So this is great. You can start building OpenGL applications. They have a nice framework put together, so you can look at that and you know figure out, okay, if I want to run an uh, OpenGL application, I can do this. The big caveat on all of this is it's using uh, EGL P buffers, and if you're not familiar with uh, P buffers, they're off-screen surfaces. So you can run stuff, but it's not going to be shown on the screen. But in the case of testing, uh, we're not usually looking at the results. It's a lot of you know just comparing results. So this is really nice when you're trying to rapidly iterate for development. Um, some caveats about this repo. Um, so it has build scripts already set up, but everything in it targets NDK version 13. And there's a specific reason it targets uh, NDK version 13, and that's because um, after that version, uh, Google stopped shipping a lot of stuff in the NDK. And one very useful thing for us is that uh, Google used to ship uh, debugging tools with uh, NDK 13. Um, 
including GDB server, uh, which is very useful when you're running applications in this environment, because if you have some kind of bug, it's nice to actually debug it. And you can't you do that with the normal Android debugger within Android Studio. Uh, so in this case, you can launch your application. You can move the um, GDB server application from the uh, NDK to the device and then use it to launch your applications that you built as you know more normal Linux applications and then run them from the ADB shell. And then you can connect it to, to it from your computer, get uh, you know a source code view, set breakpoints, do everything that you love you, uh, to do with GDB. But we can even take it further. Although the stock CTS, uh, when you try to build on an Android platform, only lets you um, target like an APK built, we can modify the CTS uh, Android platform to build more like the Linux one, where it's a command line app. And then you can, um, again, copy that to your device. And then you can run it from this nice uh, ADB shell environment. And in fact, uh, if you keep re repeating what I'm doing here, there's a, a Cargo NDK, which is a uh, implementation of Cargo targeting Android devices. It lets you build basically anything in the, the Cargo repos for Android, which includes DEQP runner, which is great because now I can run tests and they will finish before the end of the day. So the source code changes to get this all working were only 900 lines of code. It was not that complicated. Uh, the majority of the changes were in the um, KGSL backend folder that I created in source Regino DRM. Uh, but there were also significant changes in this nice file called uh, Platform Android in the uh, EGL implementation. I'll start just with my changes on uh, the KGSL backend. Um, this was responsible for doing things like uh, buffer object allocation and mapping, uh, querying properties from the kernel mode driver, submitting command queues to the hardware, and handling synchronization. Um, the majority of this code came from Turnip. Like I mentioned very early, Turnip already has support for this. So a lot of it, um, I didn't have to worry about too much. I just had to translate it to the uh, Freedrino backend interface. So it was a lot of copy and pasting. And uh, throughout the process, there was some code that could be moved to be uh, common uh, between Turnip and uh, Freedrino. Uh, but not all of that has been done uh, in, in the work I've been uh, doing. Um, so there's, again, always stuff you can do to clean up the code base and uh, make it look nicer and work nicer and reduce copy paste. Some interesting quirks about the KGSL backend that caused me a few issues. Um, there's no reference counting on buffer objects that are created within the KGSL kernel mode driver. Uh, so if you uh, try to free a buffer that's currently being used by the GPU uh, in a normal uh, DRM driver, it will get freed at a later point once uh, the, there's no references to it anymore. Uh, KGSL, as soon as you free it, it's, it's done. And uh, the first implementation I, where I got things running, uh, I ran into interesting problems where I would uh, MMU fault quite uh, frequently because memory would be freed right in the middle of the GPU drawing it. And uh, it was uh, not fun, uh, but it was fairly easy to figure out what was going on there. Another thing that uh, caused issues was the um, the KGSL kernel mode driver in the interface to pass commands to it. It has a offset parameter that is uh, completely ignored. And uh, the GPU uh, address is the only thing that's inspected. So you have to make sure that you include the offset in, uh, in the address that you actually pass when you're telling uh, KGSL the command object that you want it to run. Um, there were some necessary backend changes that the Freedrino uh, interface that I mentioned before didn't actually accommodate that were necessary in order to make it more general to different kernel mode drivers. Um, the big thing was the way that uh, frame buffers are allocated in Android are very different, and they need to be mapped in a different way. Um, they, I'll talk about it a bit later, but they come from a different memory allocator, uh, which is a lot of fun to deal with called Gralic. And um, they need to be mapped differently than buffer objects that you allocate from the KGSL directly. So uh, in the Freedrino backend, I needed to add support for a per backend implementation of mapping and importing DMA buffs to handle this unique uh, KGSL behavior. Now, those were nice changes. They were easy to make for the most part. The uh, platform Android 
changes were not as nice in, EG, uh, in EGL. Uh, this was a, a bit of a, a mess to deal with, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the not nice uh, stuff about working on this project and some of the big problem areas that still exist uh, within there today. So on Android, you have this nice graphics allocator called Relic, which is used to allocate what it sounds like, graphics memory. In our case, um, all the frame buffers for Android uh, apps and for system UI and stuff like that are allocated in, in Grawlock and then passed to us, the driver, and then uh, you know, we do our, our rendering to them. Uh, an interesting thing about Grawlock is that it's uh, implement implementation specific, uh, but Another thing about it is because Turnip runs on Android, they already have code to interface with it, so I wasn't starting from scratch again. But you go and you look at Turnip's code, and it looks like this. Um, I don't know how uh, obvious it is here, but if you look right there on the second line, um, that's not what I would call an API. Uh, you're just looking at an array of ints. Uh, and uh, you're, you know, it's not documented what they're doing. There's some magic numbers there about uh, you know, handle data, like what, it, what exactly does that mean? Uh, and then you quickly find out that um, there is no external, externally accessible <laughs> API to access internal data on uh, per device implementations of Gallic. So it's uh, not really meant uh, to be general. And uh, that code that I just showed from, the, from Turnip, uh, the way that they figured that out is they looked at the Gralic source code for Qualcomm, they figured out where the data is in, uh, in the structures, and just hacked it and made it work. And it works. You can uh, draw to surfaces. It's not pretty, but it works, and uh, it may or may not break in a future update. Uh, so, uh, just trying to get things working, I implemented the same in interface for platform Android. Uh, but this quickly becomes... Uh, quite uh, unmaintainable. Uh, I would think if uh, the more uh, non-DRM compliant kernel mode drivers got uh, support added uh, in Mesa, because like I mentioned, there's no kind of general API to access this uh, in this current implementation. Um, the code that exists right now in platform Android uh, can handle DRM drivers uh, that are running on Android. Uh, so some you know, um, devices already work well if you build an upstream kernel with, uh, and you use a recent version of Mesa. But in my case, where I'm trying to use the um, KGSL kernel mode driver, uh, that option doesn't exist to me. I have to use the Qualcomm specific version of Grawlic. Um, there is, in fact, a newer API that is supported uh, in Android, um, and it's under this file called platform Android Mapper.cpp. And there is a externally accessible API to uh, interface with the allocator that I think would allow us to do everything that we want to do. But a big issue with it is that, it, as far as I understand, it cannot be used with the Android NDK, which is the main setup right now for uh, building um, Mesa to run on Android, both in, from what I know, Turnip and my work in Freedreno. The big issue between them is this is provided by the Android system, and something uh, Android does to kind of differentiate things because of, and, and I, I'm not an Android expert, so I don't know the specifics here, but anything that's built in the system that uses C++ and it's like using the standard library, it puts it in its own special namespace, and then when you try to build uh, NDK apps, so stuff that's running as like user applications on Android, they put all the standard library in its own namespace. So if you try to access any of these functions, you'll find out that um, you can't actually access them due to namespace problems. Um, the other issue that I found out is that you can actually use these functions if you build Mesa in tree with um, Android, uh, like w building, for example, ASOP, but it's my understanding that this setup of building Mesa in tree with like ASOP is likely to be deprecated. Um, this is currently the alternative way to build Mesa without the NDK and get access to that namespace. So like I said before, I'm not an Android expert, so I'm, I'm not sure how useful this is, but if we had access to this uh, from a, a convenient way to build, I think that would solve a lot of the problems with ha having uh, 
you know, a per driver implementation of uh, the Gralak backend. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, bugs I encountered. So a big caveat to all this work, none of it is upstreamed. Uh, I ran into some problems that uh, weren't really related to the Android support, but were more uh, free Drino bugs that prevented it from working on Android in its entirety. Um, the main one was the, um, an issue with services allocated by Gralloc and the fact that they don't necessarily respect uh, GPU limitations. And um, so in my case on the, uh, ACE, the GPU in the Pixel uh, 4a, uh, the blitting engine, when it reads pixel data to copy it, it does it in 16 by 4 chunks. And if the frame buffer that you're trying to uh, write to um, or read from, is not, if it's not aligned to uh, 16 on the width or 4 on the height, you will read outside the bounds of that memory and you will trigger a fault, uh, which is what ended up happening for me uh, whenever uh, something was rendering towards the you know, bottom of the display. It would trigger an IOMU fault and uh, a lot of the times um, the, that would you know, stop the GPU from working or, or stall or cause um, flickering. So, in my opinion, this is kind of the, the biggest issue from actually making my work worth upstreaming. Um, as it stands right now, if you try to use it, uh, the Android UI will frequently cause this, this problem I'm talking about and start flickering. Uh, most applications you run will work uh, fine. Uh, just by an incredible fluke where on the Pixel 4a device, the screen resolution is divisible by 16 on the width and divisible by 4 on the height. So if you have a full screen application, it's great. You're not, you're not going to run into this problem. Unfortunately, the Android UI uh, is not, uh, not running full screen, so um, it, it does run into this problem. Um, uh, so this led me to a different path where I started looking into uh, reverse engineering a little bit because the Qualcomm blob driver uh, gets the same services that we do and is somehow able to uh, render to them without causing this, uh, this issue. So they're doing something a little bit different on, on the copying. Uh, but again, this is where things got kind of stuck. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, Freedrino reverse engineering tools because um, the last thing I did in this work was getting them to work for debugging this use case. And uh, if you're not familiar with them, Freedrino has a diverse set of tools for inspecting the GPU state. Um, but they're pretty much all designed to run from the command line in a Linux environment. So if you're trying to debug an Android APK, they're not that helpful. So, uh, in my case, one of the key tools I wanted to use was one called libwrap, which is a library that allows you to trace the uh, commands being submitted to the GPU. Um, and uh, as it, wor it works with both the Freedrino and Qualcomm driver, so you can you know, capture traces between what uh, Freedrino is doing, what the proprietary driver is doing, and start comparing them and seeing where the differences are. Unfortunately, it uses the LD preload mechanism to override system functions uh, for things like open, read, write, um, to ioctl, for example, to uh, actually capture those functions and then write them out to a file that you can use for comparison later. Uh, and because of the way Android works, you can't just you know LD preload launch your APK. It's uh, it's not as uh, nice in Linux as Linux in that regard. So how do you actually make this work with APKs? Well, the first thing is trying to figure out how you can override system functions. And there is actually a way on Android to set environment variables for applications that are like Android applications that are being launched. And there's this wrap property that you can use. And the um, Android uh, launcher will use that to set environment variables when it itself launches processes. So uh, you can go ahead and use the ADB shell to set this wrap dot and then app name for whatever the app that you're testing is property and then override environment variables like LD preload to get it to preload the lib wrap and then use that to um, start dumping the GPU command stream. Now, um, one big issue I ran into with um, doing this on Android was I quickly found out that multiple uh, threads would suddenly start accessing the KGSL file descriptor. 
and uh, the libwrap library was not designed to handle this. And so you'd go and you'd capture a trace, and it would not make any sense, because you'd have commands inserted in the middle with other ones that had were not coherent at all. And so I had to do some work in uh, making the libwrap library um, thread safe, and so that uh, this problem wouldn't happen. You could actually read the traces, and they would be coherent. Uh, and that work is, in, in fact, already uh, uh, upstream to the free genome reverse engineering tools uh, repo. So a couple uh, conclusions about this. Um, if anyone is looking to get their, their driver in Mesa running on Android, a lot of the infrastructure is already there. Like I said, there's only 900 lines of code roughly required to get this working. Uh, if it's a proper DRM driver and you're able to run that on, uh, like a, a, use that on an Android system, then there's a good chance it will likely already work. Um, if you want to use a downstream kernel mode driver um, and Gralic implementation, that's where things get a little bit more messy. Uh, but a lot of this is open source. So even though it's messy, you can go see what that library is doing to get the you know, per device specific information that you need for memory allocations to handle the stuff that you need to handle. Um, development is a lot faster. Uh, when you do work from ADB shell. Uh, when I started, I was trying to figure out you know, how I can do this in a more efficient way, trying to set up scripts that would launch APKs and get the uh, Android Studio debugger connected to things so I can inspect the state. And it just, I, I, maybe if you've been doing Android development for years, uh, this would be easier and you'd be more used to it, but I have not. Uh, I'm used to the Linux command line, and I prefer an environment that looks like that. And so once you can set up an environment like that on Android, I found development to uh, be a lot easier and make things much quicker for doing my, uh, my work. Uh, the last uh, big conclusion is uh, one of the biggest problems, I think, in Mesa right now for Android support is the Windows system integration. Uh, like I mentioned, it's pretty ugly for how it's handled right now for both Turnip and um, uh, free Drino. Um, hopefully there are Android experts around that can comment a little bit more in case I'm missing something obvious about how we can get uh, device-specific information in a way that doesn't require ugly hacks. Uh, so, you know, this is, you know, something I would like to see improved in my changes, but at the moment they work uh, without that, but you just have to be okay with a little ugliness. Um, that's everything I have uh, for my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. And the obligatory we're hiring page, if you're interested, you can apply at the link. So I can't hear you that well. Could, could you get the microphone? It is not strictly a question, but just thanks for trying Fridrin on top of KGSL. So this is not a thing that we usually do. And thanks a lot for your experience. Uh, so a, oh, OK, small question. So at some point uh, uh, a, few, a few years ago, we had to also modify the, it doesn't fully work. Uh, we had to modify SCIA to treat Fridrino in the same way as uh, treats the KGSL. Did you have to modify SCIA in, this, in any way or not? Uh, no, but SCIA would complain a lot because Fridrino doesn't support uh, why, I think it's YCRCB textures. Um, but uh, any, so as far as I understand, and again, you know, um, this was a, a lot of, my first experience dealing with more Android system level stuff. A lot of the UI in Android is rendered using Skia. And when I had it running under FreeJourno, it just worked. Um, everything rendered correctly with the exception of when the IOMMU fault would happen and then you know it would cause stuttering and, and uh, flashes in the display. But when those issues weren't happening, the Android UI looked identical to running on Qualcomm's proprietary driver. And as far as I understand, every, all of that's running on top of Skia.
I heard the rumor that Google is pushing for uh, basically at least the kernel side open drivers. Do you know anything about that? No, no I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just a curiosity question. Uh, do you feel like Google is closing the development area of the Pixel ecosystem? The closing how? Sorry. Uh, for, for example, I'm, I'm used to, to use Termux and several commands that I already don't remember uh, do not function because uh, they are not available at user level, only if, if the phone is looted. Okay. Um, that I, I'm not. Uh, okay, I'm not. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Like in this case, the development that I did, um, you could only do when the phone is rooted because you need access to the system partition to replace the libraries. But if you're, um, you know, a, a device, uh, if you're shipping devices, you have control of the image that goes on that device, and then you would just include the Freeduino driver in the system partition at that point, and you wouldn't have to like root it. I mean, obviously, the end user at that point can't change the driver. Like, it can only be changed by system updates. But uh, you know, the Android operating system is pretty restrictive in what a uh, user can do on the device. So a lot of you know, hacking like this, you have to root the device to just get access to what you need. Pixel devices are pretty good for getting a user debug image. And those uh, you can always get root on. Um, other devices, you're at the whim of the uh, vendor. Uh, it's not up to Google. Yeah, so like uh, at the beginning here, I'll just go back a couple slides. Uh, so Google has this flash.android.com tool. Uh, as far as I know, it's supported on all the Pixel devices. You can find like user debug ROMs for a bunch of different configurations. In my case, I just used ASOP, um, and that just gives you root access. Like it's very straightforward, like not complicated at all to root the device and uh, actually have access to do start doing development like this on an Android device. So thanks uh, uh, before all thanks for your talk. Uh, I, th I think it was really interesting, and I wanted to ask, uh, how do you feel about the fact that maybe users ha are being uh, locked down for using like free and open source uh, uh, replacements? Like for example, let's say Freedrino, it's uh, included in a build f for some uh, custom ROM. After all, safety net is uh, working, uh, rowing towards the opposite direction. And uh, after all, end users, like for example, uh, let's say Google Pay or some uh, Google services that are, are not easily replaceable by open source alternatives because trust and cybersecurity and all that kind of stuff. How do you feel like we can row Towards uh, completely Google-less, or or not Google-less, but <laughs> let's say like uh, free and open source uh, entire functionality, no restrict, no restricted uh, end user experience. Uh, okay, so it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I have to say that personally, I don't like the fact that um, if you run uh, like a Google app lists, uh, like Google services list device, uh, a lot of applications you can't use. I find that uh, fairly uh, annoying, uh, especially because they're things that are usually stuff that, they're not like silly games, like it's your banking app that doesn't work, or it's like your insurance app that doesn't work. So you know, it's, it's not very nice. I, my opinion on the matter is I, I think it kind of goes against the spirit of keeping things open to the user. Like me personally, 
my experience growing up as a developer was, you know, Linux was very open. You could, you know, if you want to see how something works, you can go look at the source code. If you want to start hacking on something, um, you can go do that. You can build it. And I, I kind of I feel that it restricts that, you know, availability. I do like on the Pixel devices specifically that it's easy to set up a development environment uh, where you can start accessing system stuff. And I think it gives you some of that, you know, freedom again. Uh, but yeah, I think the. No, I'm not a security expert, so I can't comment on if it's really that much more dangerous for a user uh, if they have, you know, a rooted device to access their bank information. Uh, but um, from the experience of someone who used things like hacking on the system as a way to learn how to program, I think it uh, is it's not great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.